We are back at it. Trumpowski, Trumpowski, Trumpowski. Let's make it happen. We're going to be looking at two D5 this time. And this is uh, a favorite choice of many strong grandmasters who are hoping that, you know, white plays knight D2 or E3. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of those positions. Um, for instance, if knight d2 or e3, c5 straight away and start playing for counterplay with black, um, I believe the only critical response here is bishop takes. And Sergei Tviakov is the guy you want to look at for black with playing this position. And I judge these as roughly equal positions. Like many of the, the Trumpowski, like the Trumpowski overall, in, in my opinion, is, is a great surprise weapon. But once people are really well prepared for it and know it's coming, um, you know, you, you have equality. And if you're more comfortable in the equality, then you're good to go. And for instance, in, I, I was there in 2016 when Carlsen in game one played this against Karyakin. And, you know, there was a buzz in the room. And, uh, yeah, it was good. But it was a draw, but you know, like almost every Carlson World Championship game is a draw. Almost. Most of them. Do better. I don't get to sit, tell the world champion to do better very often, so I'm going to throw it out there. Okay, so we got two branches here with E takes and G takes. So let's go ahead and start with G takes. Now, black has way too many breaks in the center. So you need to act quickly in order to seize any form of initiative. C4 straight away. So we got a bunch of different moves here. What if C6? Okay. Knight C3. Very important to grab here. Fixing the pawn structure. And I love this next idea. When we, we see this, it looks like black's just so solid, so convincing. H3 with the idea of G4. And this is a fun and interesting position for white. Keep that type of idea in mind if you haven't castled. Another idea after C4 is, what if he plays C5 and gets dynamic? We can get dynamic. We can go there. Queen takes. Just defend the center. The pins gets that extra tempo. We take. The white knights are very, very strong, and you're looking for different tactical motifs here with knight b5s. So, for instance, if knight c6, this is a very straightforward example, um, takes queen a4, we're okay to trade in these positions. You know, and overall the plan when you get get here is I would love to give this guy for this guy and then I'm gonna play against the weak pawns <clears throat> king e2 b3 a rook on the c file h rook on the d file play chess needle away at weaknesses have a slightly better end game play all day when you're not worse in any capacity you play, 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 and break your opponent. So coming back, if knight takes d4 here, and we see bishop d7, which is the more critical, well, much like many variations in the trump, we're going to get that bishop working on the long diagonal. Bishop g2. And black's trying to, to get out of the bind here, but tickle, tickle. e3. And again, we have rough equality as white is going to be playing against the double pawn in the long term. You know, slow, steady development. He may look at relocations of the knight at some point to f4, d4. But rook c1 is the first move that comes to mind here with the idea of trying to get the c5 square for the knight. If you can ever rid yourself of the bishop pair for black, all black's left with is doubled pawns and you have a superior pawn structure. So keep that in mind across many of the variations of the trump. So coming back 
instead of C6 or C5, this is the critical variation. D takes C4. Okay, E3. If he tries to hold on to it, I'm going to go after the bishop. I'm going after the bishop. Keep going after the bishop. And here, I love this next move. I'm not going after the bishop anymore. I'm going after other things. You're going to like this one. E6. And it looks as if black has spidered his way into holding on to it. Tactical alert. Grab. Grab. Mm -hmm. Pins. They do. They make the wins. Check. And after knight c6, knight takes f8. Uh, my annotations say this is a dirty position. And I agree with my annotations. <laughs> <clears throat> who's going to be more comfortable, though, at the end of the day? Someone who's looked at this, someone who's played some positions with it, looked at the computer, the anal analysis, the evaluation, or somebody who's never seen it before? You be the judge. So that's if bishop e6. The main line, though, is coming back, this c5 idea. And I found a great game from St. Petersburg 2018 between Duda and Gelfin. So this one is, is for the books. Very easy to understand that we don't want to allow an isolated pawn here. You can't let the pawn sit there on d4, so d5. And there's two different lines here, b5 or bishop g7. If bishop g7, I'm going to grab, and you're going to get this general developmental theme. I can't allow b5, so a4. You're tickling on my B, so no. But here's the great part. This one, like, because this this was fresh analysis. I'm like, really? Give up the B here? But then the longer I went with the computer, the more I began to understand that the bishop pair really doesn't have targets, and it's not as strong as it typically is. The knight pair, <laughs> rue the day. So queen d6, catassels, tickle on the f-pawn, and... Already, it's starting to become readily apparent how white has more than enough compensation here. Annoyance always counts for something. So getting back to the main game after d5, b5, chip away at the pawns. We get some liquidation going. Tickle, tickle. If bishop takes g2, just bishop f3. And uh, if he takes the rook, we take back, and then we're going to take his interest payments. And very simple plan here, which we're going to see in the main game with knight d2, knight c4. <clears throat> Straightforward. Easy money. So coming back after bishop b7, he didn't want to take the g2 pawn. In the main game, Gelfin played knight d7. We have the same idea with bishop f3, and we're going to have the same developmental idea of going after the c-pawn. Plans are where it's at. Bishop g7, b6. The pins, they're real. b7. A pawn in hand. Oh, man, it's getting worse for him. Knight a5. The pressure is just real in this game. Check. After takes, rook a8, gg. 24 move game, absolutely crushing. Duda is one of the players of the future. I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out there right now. If you're not looking at his games, you should be. So that covers the g takes f6 lines. So after bishop takes, let's get back to the main sauce. e takes f6. E3, G3, getting our typical structure that we normally go for. And I had a question when doing analysis here. I'm like, well, what if black just goes after me? Nothing to see here, nothing to be afraid of. Knight D2, he keeps coming, but we have Queen F3, and we go the other way. Love it. Otherwise, if he castles, there's no more h5 plans, so that was the only opportunity to, you know, throw some spice in your life. 
knight e2. If knight d7, we're just going to go for the c4 plan. And this is another one of those equal position with a general plan for white to make changes on the queen side with a minority attack. So you're looking in the long term, a3, b4, b5, you know, etc. Use the two versus three, make a weak pawn, attack a weak pawn. After knight e2, seeing these same themes again, castles, knight f6, c4. And I analyze these positions quite a bit, and they're equal. But there's nothing wrong with equality, especially if you understand it. So, 94. <clears throat> and I liked going off the beaten path here some. We're going to get into novelty territory now. Bonus. Takes, takes, fix the pawns first. Now, this next one is going to come in a surprise for you. Knight takes e4. You're like, but... But Tillis, what... Why would you do this? Why would you give him the bishop pair and fix his pawns? You'll see. So first, what if d takes e4? Well, knight c3, f3, we're going to reactivate the bishop. Rook a d1, no weaknesses. Knight d5, and already he's got to give up the b pair. And after rook d3, he can tell it's equal. But white has some slight pull here. Already you got some ideas with rook b3 and things that are going on. You got to be careful. But I mean, once you get rid of the b pair, black really has no, no edge. So just do it. So after knight takes e4, what if f e4? Our old friend f3 again. Tickle on the d-pawn. No attacks. Keep pressure in the d-pawn. He's got to defend it. Keep pressure in the d-pawn. Now I love this next one. Knight takes. If bishop takes, you're just going to play bishop takes. And, you know, b7 and f7 are hit pretty convincingly. So rook fd8. And this position is equal. But again, there's play to be had here. So... Play all day. Do not be afraid. So this went through our main variations. And as you can tell, unlike the h6, d6, g6 combo, I can't just give you a structure and say, do this, play this. This takes more theoretical understanding. So this is definitely a video you watch more times in order to to get the understanding of, of what you're going for and why. So again, hopefully you're enjoying this series because it's, it, was, it was a lot of fun doing the analysis here. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, bringing the Tromp back in uh, my own repertoire. <laughs>